Hi, Georgios. Pronounced perfectly. No, yeah. no, hey. was not. Was uh, Georgios? No. Yeah, that, that's that, that's perfect. Thanks. Hey, hey, Adam, how you doing? Yeah. Um, so we already clarified, you know, your your first computers and and everything. So mm -hmm. uh, today, um, Jack's Res. Excellent. Jakarta Rest now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jakarta Rest and Rest easy maybe a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. So, I mean, everyone knows what JAX RS is. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. you have a view annotations, put it on a class and you have HTTP service. So I don't like to discuss this too much, but mm -hmm. because, no, I don't like to waste your time. But what interests me is mm -hmm. what you will gain if you switch to reactive. Because uh, what, uh, I, what, what I'm doing, I'm just writing simple Java code with Quarkus. Right. As a, by the way, mm -hmm. I use Quarkus all the time. So this is this uh, uh, an old project, it's Quarkus in the backend. And we just use, you know, and an, the code looks like Whitefly, you know, in the 60s. It's just a few annotations, <laughs> nothing else. No uni, no multi, nothing. Right. Yeah. And um, and now I'm waiting for Loom, right? So and now mm -hmm. the question is, what am I missing? What are you missing? Okay, so uh, what you're doing is basically what we suggest, like, 90, 95% of people should do, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're doing, right? Um, okay, so I, I should clarify that, Although we have been maybe, um, I should say, overly zealous sometimes with the reactive uh, part of Quarkus, um, we have since like understood that, that that message probably has given people the wrong impression. Uh, so what we're trying to emphasize now is that with Quarkus, although everything is reactive under the hood, you as a developer that uses Quarkus don't have to care about that, right? You don't have to do reactive um, if you don't want to. And we think that most people in most cases should not, right? That there is Perfect. excellent. Yeah. That there is no good reason for most people to do reactive, right? Like the, 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 the cases where you need reactive, like there, there are specific use cases, Uh, but in most kinds of like, let's say, business applications, you rarely need this, right? This is very good because I ignored the uni and multi completely mm -hmm. in all projects. And if I saw this in code reviews, I even marked it as a defect. It's like, look, <laughs> because uh, if you are, you know, fast enough without that, using a framework on top of mm -hmm. uh, of JaxRS for no reason is for me a defect. And also somehow interesting story. <clears throat> so uh, um, a company asked me, you know, To, uh, to help them with high-performance Quarkus. So I said, okay, I can help you. But, uh, I mean, the question is, wh what is your expectation? I mean, what, what is the baseline of performance, right? And they say, well, yeah, we will have to have a sustained load of 2,000 transactions per second. And I say, uh, that's interesting. But uh, what, I, what I did, right, I, I found a Tech Empower uh, uh, an article, or, or Tech Empower is like a... How to call it like a, um, a stress test suite, right? Yes, which which exactly. measures the performance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Quarkus, without any you know, changes, is like 20,000 transactions per second with Hibernate. And yeah, yeah. with a Reactive, 35,000. It's okay, mm -hmm. look, you have you no know, factor of 10, you know, a breathing room. So I, I would just stick, you know, with stock code you have. And mm -hmm. after you, 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 your demand rises and you will need uh, 20,000 transactions per second, maybe we can do something about that, right? So this is, and, um, and this, this happens a lot because people are copying from your Jax Race, you know, tutorial, the mm -hmm. reactive code, and then complaining that it's complex. I say, yeah, no, the union multi, there's nothing to do with Jax Race, actually. Right. So, so the scenario you're outlining makes a hundred percent sense right like that that's exactly what people should be doing right like 2,000 transactions per second is not a high number in, in in what like modern hardware can can give you right like if mm -hmm. we were talking like 15 years ago yeah it might have been high but now no it's not so what reactive gives you essentially is that first of all it gives you much higher throughput like in this case, like you saw, maybe like 75% more or whatever. Uh, but what it also gives you that most people don't need is that the, the, the degrading, let's say, of performance is much slower. So, so mm -hmm. as, you, as you approach the limit of the concurrency you can reach, the, the application starts degrading much more gracefully, right? So you, mm -hmm. you, you would see like a, a much – a slope of the time, the, the response time is going down much slower than you would with like the blocking stuff. But again, that, that is a case that most of 
developers don't have to face, or at least don't have to face in like all their applications, right? Like, okay, there might be like some part of their architecture that really needs to, to handle this kind of load, uh, but in most cases they don't, right? So uh, we, we put a huge amount of work both into the reactive stuff and mm -hmm. into like performance optimization. We have uh, Francesco Negro, who uh, I'm not sure if you've talked to him already. Uh, he, he's like a insane performance guy who whose job basically is to make every part of Quarkus bet perform better, whether mm -hmm. it's reactive or not. Right. Yeah. Um, so so we, we put a huge amount of effort into that. But for, for most cases, right, what, what you describe is exactly what people need. Like focus on like developing your application as best you can, like with best practices and like make it readable and extendable and whatever. And if you actually face, if you, if you can prove that you're facing a performance problem, yeah, then, then, then let's talk about it. Like m most shops are not Netflix. They're, they're not Google, right? Or at least not, not from the, from, from the get go. Um, so but what we've done with, with JaxRS and all, all the rest of our stack these days is that, yeah, you can do reactive, right, if you want to. Uh, and, and you can you can mix and match reactive and non-reactive in the same application. You can absolutely do that. Uh, yeah. Where, where, where in, in cases like, let's say, like when Spring came out with their reactive stuff, uh, you basically had to choose up front whether you were going to go reactive or you were going to go blocky. You could not mix it in the same application. You still can't. Uh, so if it forces you down a very specific path with Carcass, you don't have that. Uh, you can say, like, I, I want, like, this part of the application to be reactive, and I want this part to be regular blocking. And then everything just works, right? Um, we started a project uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. and um, developers asked me, you know, do we have to use the mutiny? It's like, no, no, no. And they were really happy. So <laughs> this, is, this is interesting. So okay, so let's let's do the standard JaxOS thing. So let's say right. there's no reactive mm -hmm. nothing. I just just mm -hmm. download Quarkus and annotate a class with a path. Hello, one get then uh, produces text plane and it will return mm -hmm. a text and I have a heavy load. So what happens behind the scenes is my understanding is mm -hmm. that every request will get an own standard threat with without nothing right so and uh, this is correct right so far yes that that is correct so yeah well if we want to take it like a little a little deeper what what happens yeah. is that i'll go to as deep as you can from yeah, the quest okay. you know we we, we mm -hmm. i do curl localhost 8080 slash hello right and there is get and uh, so what happens behind the scenes in the standard standard way on quarkus awesome yeah so okay so uh uh all the io let's say, or at least mm -hmm. the, the, the beginning and the end of the IO is handled by Vertex, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we, we made a decision fairly early on uh, that we, we need to standardize all our IO stuff on Vertex because Vertex is like very, very scalable. Um, there's a team of super knowledgeable people that work on it. They, they, they handle all the low level stuff. Uh, so we, we need to reuse that, right? We don't want to reinvent the wheel of like, how to do HTTP two or three or uh, what's called web sockets, any of that stuff, like all the low level stuff we, we delegate to vertex. So that, that mm -hmm. is a huge win out of the box. So what happens is that when an HTTP request comes in, uh, it's initially handled by vertex and vertex has this, um, let's this abstraction called routes, right? So a route is basically like a high level concept that, that um, you, you use to, to handle requests in a low level, well, it's a low level for for a programmer uh, because what it, what it gives you is basically like a, a context with input and output, and you have to like figure out how to set things. So it's very very manual, right? Um, but what what it does is that it's fully non blocking. It, it, it provides like access to the body only when you need it and all that that cool stuff. So it never blocks uh, all, and it does all this on the event loop, right? So then what? Um, Quarkus REST, which, well, REST Easy Reactive, we, we can talk about the naming uh, after this, uh, is that it, it, it is a route itself. It's a vertex route itself. So then when we figure out that, you know what, now the request uh, maps to uh, what REST Easy Reactive or Quarkus REST is supposed to be handling, then that's where REST Easy Reactive takes over. And then it has a bunch of steps where, in a non-blocking manner, 
uh, it figures out like, okay, which, which part of your code is actually um, handling the, the request, which Java method handles it. And it, it figures out based on what you've used, if it should be blocking or non-blocking. So at some point, if you're like using the standard stuff, blocking all that, uh, then what we do is that we switch the entire request context from the event loop to a blocking, uh, to, to a thread pool, basically, right? A, a managed thread pool by Quarkus. Now, uh, we do that in a manner that is very transparent to the user in the sense that... But is that, it a standard? Yeah, is in the standard way, if I do nothing, I just mm -hmm. wrote, wrote the code, mm -hmm. you know, application scoped at path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then then it is blocking. Yes, then it is blocking because what we do is that we, we, we figure out from the signature of your method, right? Yeah. Uh, what you're returning, we're, we're, we're going to figure out whether it should be blocking or not. Well, you, you can control this in a, in a more fine grained manner, but usually almost always don't have to. So if you're returning a uni, then we assume it's a, it's non-blocking. If you're not returning uni multi and like you're returning like a, a POJO or a Jack's rush response or whatever, uh, then we say it's blocking. And, so, we, and when it mm -hmm. is, I think it's called async response, right? So there is like a, um, yeah, Jack's yeah, Jack Jack has this a async response thing. Well, we, we support that stuff, but I don't think we even mentioned in documentation because like that stuff is like very, old and not very usable uh, most okay. of the time. Um, so if you're using like the regular stuff, right? Yeah. So we switch to a, a, uh, a thread, basically from a thread pool. So from that point on, like the event loop is no longer being, let's say, utilized for, for this request. And we've blocked an entire thread um, for, from the thread pool to handle your request. So that means that any part of your code thereafter, where whether it's like a Jack's rest resource or like a, a response filter or a, a writer interceptor, whatever all that cool stuff that Jack's rest gives you, that can block and, and it will not cause uh, any problems, right? Um, and uh, we, 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 we try, well, okay, it, we make it as transparent as possible for users because, for example, like it's not evident to users what we have to do to, to make like the uh, request scope, the CDI request scope automatically work or the vertex context propagation stuff automatically work. Uh, that, 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 that is like hidden behind the scenes. Users never have to care about it, But what you just see is like my request scope just always works. Uh, my tracing, the, the context is always uh, propagated properly for tracing. Metrics always work. All, all that stuff just works. Uh, whether you're doing blocking or not block or security, that just works. Uh, so that, all that stuff is like super important for us to make it work, but it's also important that users don't don't ever see any problems with things. The users just expect, okay, like I'll add telemetry or I'll mm -hmm. add security and I'll add like one annotation or whatever, and then it, it should just work, right? They don't have to care about how it how it happens, whether it's blocking or not blocking. <clears throat> What's the name of this thread pool? Can I configure it somehow? Do I have to configure it? You don't have to, no. Uh, we configure it automatically. Uh, but um, So it's based on a project called uh, JBoss um, Executors, I think, or I'm not sure. It's called an, ex an enhanced executor service. Um, mm -hmm. So it does a bunch of like extra stuff in addition to what the... Ah, yeah, I remember. Case. This is wide thread. In one point of time, yes, we have the auto yes, configuration exactly. of the, of the threading. Okay, exactly. So it's very similar. The idea is very similar. There, you don't have. There, we have configuration options uh, that allow you to configure like the size of the threads and stuff like that. But if you don't do anything, uh, we default to. I don't. Know, I think like I don't remember like how, how we do the calculation exactly, the number of threads or uh, of like the stuff like that. Yeah, but but all that is that it is configurable. So the the project, like you said, it's been around since the Wildfly. Uh, years, it's super stable. Like it's been constantly updated. And again, like uh, the folks that work on it, like always look into the newest JDK stuff and like look at the performance that they test it on, like some super weird configuration with ARM and stuff like that. So it's it's uh, super stable. So this actually is a cool story about Quarkus. That the mo and most you know frameworks behind the scenes come from Whitefly, and they are uh, battle uh, uh, proofed, right? So that they are actually used in lots of projects, and you mm -hmm. are just picking whatever you like, and uh, and uh, exactly on, so sh that, that, on shoulders of giants, right? So it, is that that is absolutely true. So that was a huge boost for Quarkus, like from the beginning, both in terms of like how quickly we were able to get stuff out, and how let's say production ready this stuff is, because like you said. 
Uh, we're building on like Hibernate, right? We're building on Vertex. We're building on uh, a bunch of uh, Wildfly stuff. And all this stuff already exists. Like we didn't build this stuff from scratch. Sure, we enhanced it. We, we made it better. It changed because of Parker's requirements. But this stuff was already battle tested way before uh, Quarkus mm-hmm. came around. So, mm-hmm. so in the in the case of uh, standard requests, what I understood mm-hmm. is that uh, the uh, JAXRS is registered in Vertex. Vertex examines the um, return values of the method, and depending whether it is a normal one, POJO or response, or mm-hmm. union multi. Um, so in the case of uh, normal one, POJO or response, mm-hmm. the request gets offloaded to a thread pool, so yes. it is free for next request in the Vertex, which is crucial because we must not block Vertex because the exactly. idea is mm-hmm. there's one event loop mm-hmm. similar to Node or whatever, which handles you know the entire uh, the, uh, the the incoming events, and you must not you know uh, block that because then everything will stop. And why it is the case? Because mm-hmm. every thread costs some memory. Mm-hmm. And uh, you try to be efficient with the threads. And this was the whole point of reactive programming, to my knowledge, right? So yes. you, you try to minimize the amount of threads and the um, and the amount of busy waiting, right? So you, you say mm-hmm. there is there is no waiting. If someone has to wait, then uh, the, the thread gets freed. And this was the idea of reactive programming. This is why the API is so strange, because you have to mm-hmm. implement differently in order to give the thread a chance, you know, to do something else, right? Yeah, exactly. So that, that's exact, that, that's the very, very, um, very good way of putting it. So, it, yeah, in reactive programming, you can't block, right? Because essentially, like you said, uh, like in, in Node, basically, you have like one thread in Java React, well, Java Reactive Land, which is all based on Netty, basically, and then Vertex is on top of Netty. But you, you have an... Uh, uh, you have a group of event loop threads. So you don't have one. You, you have like, typically you have the, the number of cores uh, that you have. So if you have like an eight core machine, you'll probably have eight uh, event loop threads. But in any case, you can't block those, right? Because like you said, if for whatever reason, whatever process that is running on the event loop blocks, then you're seriously degrading the performance of the system because there are no more uh, threads to handle the, the rest of the requests. So that, that's why you everything has to be written in an async manner, right? So you mm-hmm. do something and you return like a future, a promise, call it whatever you want, that at some point, like I'll do something else, but I, mm-hmm. I cannot block. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how many groups you have in Quark- Quarkus? So you have so, so you mean, this is uh, like, you know, one vertex loop per domain, per like, core. you know. Per core, okay. Per core, yeah. So, so th- that's the other, like, let's say, internal detail mm-hmm. that uh, Quark is like wherever, uh, no matter like if you're doing like HTTP or gRPC or GraphQL or Kafka, whatever, uh, it it is all handled by the same uh, group of threads in Vertex, right? Mm-hmm. And as long as none of these block, it, it all just works. And it, it, like you said, it's it's efficient because you have the minimum number of threads handling all these I/O requests. And also, it is smart because if you call, you know, uh, methods from different, let's say between Kafka and something else, mm-hmm. you have less problems with you no know, switching between threads, right? Yes, exactly. That's very, very important, right? So when when you're getting into like low latency, high performance stuff, that is very important to to not mm-hmm. switch between threads. But it's also very important from a user perspective because. Um, a lot of frameworks, like like transactions, for example, right? You, the, the, they store the information in a thread local. So th- there is context hidden somewhere, and that context needs to be moved from one thread to another when you're doing this offload, like security, transactions, tracing, all that stuff, like just basically hidden behind thread locals, and they need to be moved around uh, mm-hmm. when, when this kind of stuff happens. So when you can minimize that moving around, um, you can get much better performance. Yeah, and thread local becomes uh, a little bit problematic with uh, Loom because uh, they don't like yeah, they they, yes. they 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 would like to have the scoped values. I think is the yes, right? yeah, scope value, yeah, yeah, exactly. So pretty cool. So it means um, so the I have the uh, amount of vertex threads is the amount of cores roughly. I, can yeah. I monitor it somehow? Is it visible? Yes, it is. Like if you do a thread dump, if you do a thread dump, you will see a bunch of threads called event loop thread zero one two. Three, yeah, four, yeah, so, exactly. So. Yeah, so but you there's get, no like, monitoring mm-hmm. API or something like you know. Uh, well, I Threat? think that, yeah, that there there are a bunch of um, vertex like uh, like metric style APIs 
that mm-hmm. we usually utilize. So I think if you um, if you add like the, the Quarkus um, metrics uh, extension, then I think we do have some entries in okay. there that will give you the number of threads, right? Okay. So um, <clears throat> one interesting question. So it seems like Node.js mm-hmm. has one uh, event loop mm-hmm. and Quarkus has one per core. So yes. it means is actually uh, Quarkus should scale better than Node. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so I so thought it, this is, I will answer, it depends. This was my impression that it always has. But uh, uh, you know how, how how much faster it is? If you, if you, mm-hmm. uh, well, we had tried some stuff back in the day. Now, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to say numbers because I don't, I really don't remember. Uh, well, I, I should clarify that in the Node world, a lot of the times, or at least when I was working with Node a few years ago, what they did is that they started multiple processes uh, for each application, which would then each process would get its own thread. So that's how they would like scale it out more. Whereas in the Java world, you don't have to do that uh, because like Netty will give you this event loop uh, group. Yeah, but this will be will comparable do. to starting in Java multiple Quarkus instances yeah, yeah, exactly, in JVM. Exactly, yeah, but, exactly. but this is less efficient. I mean, this absolutely. Is... No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no question about it. Mm-hmm. No, because I'm interested you know, in in the cloud, uh, cloud world, I use Quarkus and uh, mm-hmm. people somehow thinking Java is uh, less efficient. And the truth is Java is uh, way more efficient than, than, than Python and, and, and JavaScript or TypeScript. Absolutely. And, um, and I was actually always surprised, uh, surprised by, you know, how, how to call it, how inefficient maybe Node.js <laughs> From 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 the outside world, uh, from for me, I never work with Node.js. It's just my um, outside view. What I understand is, mm-hmm. because already at the beginning, with uh, it was Grizzly and 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 uh, and uh, the event loop. Even this was uh, more you know sophisticated than Node.js at the beginning. So I, mm-hmm. I just wondered what maybe they cannot do this differently because of threading in in inside JavaScript. But but I mean this is not. In Java, it is like obvious, right? So we have yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So and okay, cool. So now, so we clarified now a little bit of JaxRS on top of Vertex. So basically, what JaxRS on Vertex and Quarkus is is, uh, I would I would say ninety five percent Vertex and a small decorator around Vertex JaxRS, right? So it, it just reads the metadata and and executes the method. That's basically it, right? Uh, well, I wouldn't say 95%, but um, yeah, th- there's a lot going on because the JaxRS spec is large and plus that uh, we, we wanted to um, read all the metadata at build time. So you, you have the Quarkus part, which takes all the metadata uh, at build time like and creates a meta model that at runtime is just accessible so we never have to read any annotations yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, so there is there is a lot of work going on, but yeah, like without Vertex, uh, it would uh, it would be much much harder. Right? We, we, no, but I, I would say I know that JaxRS is, is is big, but um, if we just uh, think about the example, hello world mm-hmm. with one annotation. So mm-hmm. it, you, you just read the metadata and tell you know Vertex if you see the route, then then you are in charge and come back. So this is like you know mm-hmm. this is like most of the work is done in Vertex. And, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. In that okay. case, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. In Quarkus uh, three, I think uh, are all mm-hmm. dependencies reactive, right? So if I pick JaxRS, it is already reactive, or because back then there was classic and reactive, but there's no more the distinction, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So this is <laughs> okay. So I should just say like naming is hard, right? Naming yeah. is very hard, and I-, I need to apologize. We have created massive confusion to to yeah. the Quarkus users, unfortunately. So here's the story. Um, when when Quarkus first came out, there was no, there was only one REST stack, and that was REST Easy. So we had yeah. Quarkus REST Easy, and that was like only blocking. It gave an impression that it had some reactive features, but it really didn't. So it was like only blocking. And REST it was genius. And, I was happy for years with one dependency. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> and we, we that, that's the same REST easy that is used in Wildfly and has been used in Wildfly for like a decade or whatever, right? So we started with that. Great. Uh, then, like for various reasons, like um, build time efficiency, like scalability, and wanting to you wanting to provide a seamless reactive experience. Uh, myself and a couple other guys, um, Stuart Douglas and Stefan and Marno. Oh, okay. Well, actually, it was started by them. Like Stefan and Stuart actually started this prototype, and then 
I was on uh, vacation at the time, and I, when I saw in the demo, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to get involved in this. This, this looks awesome. So we started. Never go to vacations. There's no worst things happen if you're on vacation. <laughs> yeah. So someone starts something or deletes something or changes something, right? No, but, but no, for me, it was a great surprise. Like, I came back and, oh, well, this, is, this is awesome. So, yeah, okay. I, I, I started working on this uh, based on their prototype. And we, we all, like, uh, thought that, you know what, Brush is great, but. Uh, that there are things that we can do in park is to make it even better. Uh, so we started working on that. And at the time, like we didn't have a name. I think the initial name that uh, Stuart and Stefan had was like QRS or something like that. Um, so we're like, this is not a good name. So when we were coming, when we were approaching like the end, like feature completeness, basically, uh, we're like, okay, let's call it Quarkus Rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll say Quarkus Rest. Um, but then we're like, okay, this doesn't convey the fact that it is basically an evolution of the rest easy project. Okay. Uh, which it was, we, we took a lot of uh, code from there um, and, and stuff like that. Although we, we did build it from scratch and we took a lot of pieces of code from rest easy. So we're, we're like, okay, we need to signify that this is that the rest easy brand uh, is alive and doing very well. So let's, Let's incorporate the Rest Easy name in it somehow. So the idea that was uh, thrown around then, which I thought was like very good at the time, um, was that let's call it Rest Easy Reactive, right? Because that's like we'll show that it's more modern. Um, it can do anything and stuff like that. So we we essentially, when we released it, we, we called it Quarkus Rest Easy Reactive. Um, but uh, what happened was that the, what, what – we, the feedback from the users is what was that okay? Why should I use Re Quarkus Rest Easy Reactive when it's going to force me to use Reactive, right? And we explained again and again that no, you don't have to. But everybody's like, well, it's in the name, right? What, why, why, why would you call it Reactive if you don't have to be Reactive? And, and to add to the confusion, um, you have like, on the other hand, you have like Hibernate, Hibernate, Reactive, where in that case. You do have to use reactive if you're using Hibernate Reactive. It's not a choice. It's a, it, it's a, so, a so the confusion was your fault, right? So what I understand. Yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. Ah, it was the our emails fault. to you. I will put the email right. So on the on the yeah. show notes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it, it, no, it, it was our fault for choosing reactive in the name mm -hmm. when it doesn't force you to be. Yeah. Right. So it's absolutely our fault. This created a lot of confusion. So uh, a few versions ago, I think starting 3.7, basically we said, okay, like this is creating too much confusion. Let, let, let's do something uh, about it. And we said, okay, we're going to rename Rest Easy Reactive to Quarkus Rest. And because we're doing this, let's also rename some other extensions that are causing confusion. So the Rest Easy React, the Rest Client Reactive, right? We're going to call it Quarkus REST Client. The Quarkus Reactive Messaging, we're going to call it Quarkus Messaging because all these extensions essentially give you the freedom to choose whether you want reactive or not, right? So you have the extension and you can do whatever you want. With it. You can want blocking, do blocking. You want reactive, do reactive. So we renamed a bunch of the extensions. Now, now in, in all the extensions, it's clear, like if reactive is in the name, then you have to use reactive. Like Hibernate Reactive means oh, that okay. you have to use reactive. If you're using Hibernate RM, you're using block. But with Quarkus REST and the new REST client and uh, Quarkus Messaging now, you, you get to choose. So hopefully, and we put a blog out explaining all this uh, and a, an ADR, so architectural decision record that uh, like describes all our thought process around this. So for people who like really want to see the details, they can follow along. Uh, and read it. So hopefully we're after years of sowing confusion, we're trying to uh, make things easier when it comes to naming, right? Two things. So before the <clears throat> name change, mm -hmm. the uh, my advice was uh, simple. So what I said, if you would like to have a micro profile on on Quarkus, for instance, mm -hmm. so I just follow you know the small ray. So small mm -hmm. ray is the uh, micro profile implementation if right. you say small right dash whatever full torrents you get the micro profile and there was one exception this was the uh, quarkus rest no R quarkus rest client right so the, right, the name yes. was different the rest client was not small right rest client it was the i think quarkus right quarkus rest yes client? it's crying quarkus rest client yes yeah so and now i would be uh everything small right except the uh 
the Corpus Res grant, right? So this yes. is, this will remain the same. Yes. And exactly. um, okay, so um, uh, so this worked well. And um, what uh, I also started to do because I read somewhere, or uh, I get the hint that the re reactive Jacks Res and the reactive stuff is going to be the future because it's more modern, even if you're not using the reactive stuff in JAX mm -hmm. And the old one, in one point of time, could become deprecated if the new stuff accords to the standards, right? So if the new one will uh, will pass all these uh, microprofile or JAX uh, and Jakarta e-tests, mm -hmm. then the old one might be uh, deprecated. So what I did in all my projects, mm -hmm. I migrated before the name change from uh, Jax OS to Jax OS Reactive without changing mm -hmm. the code, just the library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was a lot of work, not because uh, the, uh, the Jax OS uh, Reactive is, uh, is somehow incompatible. The problem is it, the, the old Jax OS is more lenient. So you can introduce errors and it still goes. And the mm -hmm. Jax OS Reactive is more strict, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, what we find out in a larger code base if you have duplicates, path duplicates, which is an ah, error. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the classic, the old one still goes and the new <laughs> one just complain, which was perfect for us, right? But right. Uh, there are lots of such as things in a larger mm -hmm. project. And uh, this, then of course, there were some problems with um, availability of HTTP servlet, right? So what you can yes. do in the mm -hmm. old one, you can go, you know, and um, uh, what I had to do, I think I fetched a header or something. And mm -hmm. there's an, different way to do this. So you have to know it. Absolutely. So my advice is, you know, migrate as early as possible. In a small project, there is nothing to do. If your project mm -hmm. is large, for sure, you will find some problems with your code base. So is and, and this is, I, I would say, do it always. So always use directive. Um, and um, yeah, this is, this is my feedback. And I, um, so, yeah. I, I completely agree. So in the Quarkus context, like Quarkus REST is what we focus all our efforts on. Uh, all our energy, like new features, bug fixes. So the, the, the Quarkus Rest Easy, which is based on the Rest Easy project, that is absolutely still something that will exist because Rest Easy is used in Wildfly and like Wildfly has to be around forever. So th there is a team that does that. But but the Quarkus focus for like new features and all that stuff absolutely goes into Quarkus Rest. Uh, now, uh, as you saw, like in, in a lot of the cases, like when you move from one to the other, you don't have to do anything. Right. Absolutely. There are cases where the, the two implementations are different because there's stuff like in the spec that isn't specified or isn't tested. So the two things could be different or some in some cases like Quarkus took a few different decisions because like we don't we don't aim to pass like every single test from TTK. Like we run a but we run thousands of them. But there are a few that we explicitly like disable, say like we're not going to deal with this. Yeah. You're so right. there are things like that, yeah. Um, also, what I found out, there was mm -hmm. some issues with the... Uh, or I don't know whether there are issues. Maybe the old one was wrong. Mm -hmm. We use JSON B and uh, JSON P at the same time. Okay. And what I found out, this is this is, uh, this is like one year ago or something, that mm -hmm. um, that the in the reactive case, the order was different. How the serializer worked, you know that uh, oh, okay, it seems yeah. like the JSON B and JSON P the serialization chain was mm -hmm, different. Mm -hmm. We caused some problems. In our case, it didn't matter at all because we switched to JSON P entirely. Okay. So, um, but uh, there were some issues, and I wanted to create an issue, but uh, for Quarkus, but um, but I couldn't articulate that. So this was only in some cases, and I couldn't find you know the reason why it happened. So I said, okay. okay, then 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 forget it. But um, maybe to the listeners, if they have some issues, they use JSON B and JSON P at the same time. So on that note, mm -hmm. what I'm also curious is uh, Jack Jackson, right? So um, in my project, in larger project, I'm using Quarkus or small right JSON P. Okay. And I expect it to be too slow. Fact is, it's crazy fast. So I said, okay, there's nothing to do. So we can go with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and I just, I, I, I thought, you know, we have to use Jackson. This was my expectation. But we stick with the standard. And, and I mean, mm -hmm. no problem at all. It seems like Quarkus promotes Jackson. And uh, mm -hmm. for me, it's okay. Jackson is, is a way, but in small right, we have JSON P and JSON B. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so 
maybe I introduce myself already, but what usually happens, I get, you know, requests from companies and they searching more or less for solutions. Say, look, we would yeah. like to build a thing. What do you do? So, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I get hired as an architect, but after two mm -hmm. days I'm coding and there are <laughs> other developers, right? And uh, and we need a simple rules. Right. And my rules so far was pick Quarkus, mm -hmm. but take a look at a micro profile and everything is described. Pick all the extensions from micro profile and here we go. But right. they... For unknown reasons, they go then to Quarkus tutorials and then found, you know, Jackson, we already clarified uni, uni and multi. Mm -hmm. So this is, but, but, but the Jackson. And I say, should we use Jackson or not? And I say, okay, if you already use Jackson, stick with it. But um, I would go with MicroProfile. So what's your opinion? What's mm -hmm. your take? Why, why is the, the, the promotion of Jackson, you know, in, in, in Quarkus so strong? Right. Okay. And that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Well, I'm very glad we can, uh, like, elaborate on this. Uh, history, like how, how we got here, right? So when Quarkus started, basically, um, we were pretty much exclusively promoting JSONB, right? Mm -hmm. JSONB was like what we were, that's like the first thing we integrated with when it came to JSON serialization. That's what we were promoting because for, for the reasons you're, you're saying that yeah, it, it's, it's a spec, um, it, it has multiple implementations. So we were using the well, what's he called? Like, not, not, not a Pansy Johnson. The other one, uh, uh, like, Yasin. Yasin, yeah, exactly. We, 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 ha we, we, we started with that. We are, we, we continue to have that and, and all that good stuff. So, uh, but over time, what we saw from users was like most people, like a very large majority, were using Jackson. Right. Yes. Um, so we, we we obviously created a, an extension for that. It integrates great into there, and everything works. So we support both. But the 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 uh, truth in the matter is that we see a lot more um, community adoption for Jackson. That's one thing. And the second thing is that Jackson has a lot more features. Then. Yeah. Yes, yeah. at least like, so many yeah. more features. So yeah. um, that's one. That's the other thing. And third, that um, ja uh, Jackson is very well tested against uh, serialization CVEs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so these come up a lot. Jackson has dealt with them for the past ten or fifteen years. Uh, the community there is super responsive. They 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 always like uh, even like very minor CVs that you could borderline say that they're not CVs. They they always like uh, take the time to to address all, all this stuff. So that was uh, again a, a very big thing. Now, um, I, in Quarkus REST and the other ones like so Quarkus Messaging and the REST client. These do not force you to use Jackson. Now, it, it, it is true that if you go to the tutorials, most of the time, the first thing you're going to see is Jackson, right? But um, if you really do want to use, like, uh, MicroProfile, then you can use, like, REST Client Jason B and uh, Carcass REST Jason B. And that, that, that will just work. It will just give you uh, fewer few features uh, than, than what you have with Jackson. It's just marketing, but this important one. This is important. You had that conversation with Quarkus guys all the time. So um, if we say, mm -hmm. if you use Quarkus, yes, use just best of breed, you know. So pick whatever you like, and here we go. Exactly. So it will work perfectly and even better for projects who really like Quarkus and the are uh, highly, you know, optimized towards Quarkus. Mm -hmm. But um, why I got so many Quarkus projects? The only reason why I got the project was similar back then. Why I could use Glassfish or introduce Glassfish or even Whitefly is. Because I say, okay, the Quarkus is very compatible with MicroProfile. Mm -hmm. You don't have to learn Quarkus. You can just stick with MicroProfile, right? Yes. And um, I was uh, in Java user group meeting um, and uh, like Java for Java haters, right? <laughs> and uh, and they asked me, you know, how to learn Java. And this was the, the, the uh, and, and I said, okay, look, um, just take a look at MicroProfile. You will see, you know, the JaxRS, Hello World. Copy it over to Quarkus and it works. Mm -hmm. And I got feedback, but if you go, you know, to the Quarkus tutorial, there are like, you no know, 20 ways of doing the same thing, how to pick one. <laughs> so yeah. um, so this is the problem. And if we say, okay, micro profile is good enough, you know, for enterprise applications, and mm -hmm. uh, then you have one source and you can build the entire stack 
without knowing anything about Quarkus. But with Quarkus, it happens to be the most performance scalable, GraalVM compilable, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. runtime. You get the best of both worlds. But if right. you are leaving the microprofile path, now you have to explain, you know, to Java mm -hmm. developers who, enterprise Java developers who only care and deliver the application, use Jackson and all this, use this and all this, and you have a huge matrix which you have to support. And the worst of all is, if they you know, find an extension on Quarkus, which is supported by one developer, you know, it's not even the Quarkus core team, the chances are very high that the developer get the boost factor, bus factor, whatever, will disappear. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you stick with the old stuff. So I say, you have to be careful marketing a Quarkus, what it is. I would say it is what I would like to have. It's like more like Rails experience back then, Ruby on Rails, you know, remember? Mm -hmm. So it's like out of the box. So, yeah. okay, if you build stuff, you know, CRUD, boring application, Go is microprofile. It's not perfect. Maybe it is 20% slower than uh, highly optimized Vertex stuff, stuff, but it's very easy. But mm -hmm. if you would like, you can you can replace whatever you like. You can replace, you know, JaxRS with Vertex Plane. You can re replace, you know, whatever. And this will be my message because if this is no more there, I would say you will lose some clients. Yeah, I see what you're saying. No, I, I, I completely get that. Like, I completely get the the the, the um, portion of the users that really want to be compatible and we do hear that for, in the community a lot but, but not even compatible uh george uh, yours <laughs> yeah. yeah. george yeah just george i mean it's easy yeah. easiest for everybody no but I, I would like to learn you know uh greece so, uh, <laughs> so um uh, but uh it's not about being micro profile compatible and being able to swap corkus i think this mm -hmm. is not not the point anymore mm -hmm. it's more or less you have a single page where you can learn okay. everything, oh, you know this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my selling point to micro profile, the uh, no, this is somehow consistent spec. You mm -hmm. can copy and paste code and it works. And 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 the experience of ours great as as I showed you know the micro profile IO page with you know the mm -hmm. boxes and they click on it and you see the HTML page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's nice. But if you go to Quarkus, go to JaxRS, you know Quarkus mm -hmm. tutorial. So you will find all the possibilities how to expose Hello World. And this is just overwhelming, you know. And yeah, and, and, okay. yeah. This is this is would be my feedback. So misuse MicroProfile as a tutorial resource and go for it. And and this is why I still, if there is no reason, I will stick with Jason and Jason B mm -hmm. because it's a part of the tutorial. And and I think the chances are are very slim or actually not existing in my project that someone will switch from Quarkus to Helidon. Or micro. Right. Okay. Okay. That, so this is like be, not, mm -hmm. and, and no one will test in my projects the compatibility. No one cares about that. Okay. It's, yeah. So this is the, 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 it was maybe 10 years ago was a different story, but right now it's just about the convenience. And I think the out of the box experience becomes more and more, you know, important. So what mm -hmm. I tried to do at the beginning have one dependency, one extension micro profile. Okay. And this would pull everything, but I stopped mm -hmm. because I had no time. But something like this is also cool, you know. You say just micro profile and get everything. What I do in projects, I have uh, a template with all the uh, mic uh, micro profile dependencies, and they okay. just clone it and use it. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a feedback from project, yeah, but it's inefficient. But there's almost no difference. So Quarkus with yeah. micro profile starts as fast as without, so no one cares. I, I have to say, this is like Agreed. you get some, you know, marginal gains uh, with <laughs> skipping some, you know, some some, some dependencies. Yeah. I completely agree. Like, yeah, that, that makes a hundred percent sense to me. Like, especially for, for developers, like just, uh, want, want to get something going immediately. And that, what you explain with the micro profile IO and the documentation makes a hundred percent sense. But the flip side is this. Okay. Um, you have a ton of spring developers out there. Yeah. Right. So many, so many. Yeah. And it, we also have to make it familiar, let's say, to, to them, right? Because yes. when we when we want to convert people from Spring to Quarkus, we don't want to tell them like that by default, the out-of-the-box experience is that like, you know, like you have to use everything new, right? So uh, it, it's, it's a constant, let's say, balancing act between like yeah. uh, making it easy for people who already know standards to use it and making it easy for people who come from a slightly different world, a dominant world, I dare say, uh, yep. to to come to Quarkus and like get up and running as fast as possible. 
And in their world, like Jackson is like the only thing. Like nobody uses Jason B. Uh, no, in, you're right. In the spring world. <clears throat> yeah. So it, it's hard, right? We're trying to do both. Like obviously we can't succeed great or later 100% in, in doing both. But I think we're, we're, we're trying to, to balance it as, as best we can. But um, one <clears throat> dependency manager, you know, a uh, micro profile dependency on Quarkus, which uh, mm -hmm. for the for the micro profile people would be actually a good thing. Um, I tried, yeah, yeah. you know, to, to mm -hmm. implement one, but the problem is it is then you know maintained by me. No one cares about that. So yeah, it, it, I see what you're saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but you are absolutely <clears throat> right with the balancing act and and Spring. Also, interesting story. Um, and the client asked me, you know, they have to migrate. I think it was Spring Boot or Spring mm -hmm. uh, even. I don't know, and I also forgot the versions. But the problem mm -hmm. is with the Spring uh, migration was because there is no API, so it's like the uh, API in implementation was the same. They mm -hmm. had to migrate twice, and the problem is with the Spring migration, um, all the dependencies were hardwired to the Spring. So you know, with the newest Spring, you got also the newest Jackson, whatever, and everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jackson was not the problem. I, I forgot what the, what the two are dependencies out there, which changed slightly. So you had to migrate, you know, the entire project to use, you know, the the, the other implementation, mm -hmm. which uh, on Quarkus it never happened in my projects because even if you upgrade Quarkus, micro profile remains the same. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would maybe get the problem if I would use Vertex behind the Quarkus di directly, yeah, and yeah. with mm -hmm. the newest Quarkus I get the newest Vertex, and then I have the, exactly mm -hmm. the same problem as in Spring. But because yes. I'm using JaxOS and JaxOS didn't change for. 15 mm -hmm. years or whatever, <laughs> I never had a problem in the Quarkus. And if I had a problem, like like, like I told you, it's like um, the new Quarkus, you know, found out uh, some mm -hmm. some problems with my implementation, which I which I fixed and then it was solved, right? So it's just the argumentation, I would say, and, and this is not a problem, but it's more or less a marketing and perception. Yeah? But this comes mm -hmm. with the Quarkus stronger and stronger. I even recorded a video, how to learn Quarkus, and I showed with um, MicroProfile, and I got, I got actually a very good feedback because they say, okay, cool. this is, this is you no, know, what we, what we like to have. Well, like a portal, we, mm -hmm. we go there and there's the entire app, everything is described and just use it, right? Yeah, that makes, that makes 100% sense. And I should, I should absolutely say here that documentation for us has always been hard, right? Yeah, very hard. We, we, yeah. We, we, we've heard from a lot of people that, from a lot of people, it's like, oh, it's awesome. But also from a lot of people that like documentation is terrible, like, I can't find anything, or like you said, there are too many ways to do the same thing. So we have tried, um, like throughout the years, to improve and to to like change to have different things like quick starts and then reference guides and different things like that to try to break things up a little, uh, make it more easier to follow. It, it's been hard, right? Documentation for for a project of this scale and of With people coming from such diverse background backgrounds, it's it's been hard. Yeah, so, but it's definitely ongoing. For me, the the documentation works very well. I have to say because uh, mm -hmm. um, I find what I what I need. I know where to look at. It's okay. This uh, vertex is not that interested, but this is maybe interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I really like is the search for the config properties. Right, so that I can <laughs> just so, so so for me, I have to say yeah. it's very good. But I see the point from the community that uh, there there are 20 ways you know, to do the absolutely. same and, and this is at the beginning is is this is hard to tell right so yes absolutely. um uh one selfish question because um Hit what it. i have to do right now mm -hmm. actually i have jacks mm -hmm. and i have an um container request and response interceptor i can use another interceptor i don't care but mm -hmm. what i would like to have is I would like to have the message size of both direction, the request size, mm. you know, size in and size out. And um, I, I, had, I performed some hacks, but it is not that easy to get it out. What I would have learned is if you if you activate compression, I will get it. But it's okay <laughs> for that, right? So this is uh, hard. But um, what I don't like to what I have what I would like to prevent is to have the byte array output input stream and just to serialize everything to me and, and measure this. Do, is there easy way in REST easy, you know it, out of the calf to, to, uh, to measure the size of both messages? I, out of the box, no. I don't think okay. we have anything. No problem. I thought you know you you already know it. And um, in worst case I would do the byte array thing, it just doesn't matter <laughs> anyway. This is small yeah. messages, so, so okay. this is the proven so for the listeners is what you can always do, you know, you can intercept the um, streams and mm -hmm. write to your own byte array, measure exactly. the performance and and uh, sorry the size and and paths. But 
for me, it seemed inefficient, but this is the most standard way probably mm-hmm. you can do. Yeah, so, okay. so this, this like, it, there's no, like, out-of-the-box solution here because, again, like, because every every I.O. thing, it goes from Vertex, and Vertex, like, lazily and, like, uh, uh, doesn't buffer stuff, right? So you, you have, like, a, a constant stream. So, yeah, you have to, like, hold things in memory, like, if you want yeah. to figure out, like, the entire thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Reactive JaxRS. So we, we discussed mm-hmm. a little bit, you know, the classic. So what happens in the reactive way? So I have mm-hmm. multi, multi or uni in mm-hmm. my response. What's right. the difference? So what happens now? Right. So what the difference is that um, when we determine that, like, uh, you are using an async type, like uni or multi or even, like, completable, complete, completable state, completion stage or completable future, um, th- in those cases, we assume that you are using non-block that the, your your implementation of the Jack Trust method is non-blocking, right? So in that case, what we do is that we we continue the entire processing of the JaxRS request on the vertex event loop thread. So it never switches to a different thread. Um, and, and the is- reason is because. It is already offloaded, right? Because if no, you're no. returning the the completion stage, the process ah, yeah. happens somewhere yeah, yeah. else, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, all the pro, all the stages, let's call them, happen on the same thread, but they don't block, right? Because you're just returning something that completes at some other time, and then when, when that completes, the, the the thread just figures that out and uh, continues with the rest of the steps. So, yeah, uh, the entire processing on the thread on the same thread. But it, yeah, like you said, it's it's possible because you're not blocking, and like each, the the same thread can handle multiple requests at the same time because none of those are, are blocking, and they they've offloaded their their computation. Uh, now the the advantage here is that um, when you're not switching to a different thread, uh, you get higher performance, right? Um, like if in the simplest you, um, hello world case where all you're doing in your Jack's rest method is like return hello world, like a string that just return yes. hello world. So nothing else. Uh, if you do that with a uni, like return uni dot create, create dot like item hello world, then the performance of the, the, the non-blocking version versus the blocking version is probably like, I think it's like 30% higher something mm-hmm. like that in the non-blocking version. Uh, just because like the, the, the um, switching from one thread to another, that is what uh, causes all the, um, all, all the, the, incre- the, the latency increase, let's call it. Now, when you're, so, uh, yeah. N- not that it, because of this, you know, all the listeners switch to reactive again, to give you some numbers. <laughs> I, I'm running now Quarkus, a huge Quarkus application as Lambda, as a serverless mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. Uh, Jason P., and mm-hmm. uh, if we return you know, just JSON P object with serialization and everything, the mm-hmm. performance from outside is between five and ten milliseconds. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, a, this is this is what a, you're talking about. So if you are thirty percent mm-hmm. uh, faster, it will be maybe yeah, yeah. one millisecond, right? So this yeah, exactly. Be so that, that is a very good point. Yeah. So percentage, it does sound high, but in, in yeah. the real world, like yeah, it's not going to be it, it's it's not going to be worth it in almost all cases. Right. Yeah. And, again, and now if we say that, OK, now it's actually going to do something. Let's say talk to the database. Right. Like just fetch a record from the database. So if you're going to use like Hibernate for the blocking case and Hibernate Reactive for the reactive case, you're not going to see almost any difference in the response time. Right. Because like yeah. all the because the entire um, time is dominated by how the data, the, the interaction mm-hmm. with the network and the database and mm-hmm. all that. What. The, the, what it really does, basically, um, what, what it gives you is that, like, if you, the load is so high at some point, the reactive stuff will, will allow you to, to handle more requests and to for the application to degrade more gracefully than where the blocking case will just, like, hit a wall at some point. Like, everything will just collapse when you get, when you get past mm-hmm. a certain point, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, what's what's also what I like the fact is that you can use, use completion stage for instance, which is a part mm-hmm. of JDK. So There's nothing Quarkus specific, yes, exactly. and still exactly. So um, 
when to use completion stage and when to use uni. <laughs> is there any reason you know to use uni over completion stage? Yeah, completion stage API is like very okay. hard. Very hard. Yeah, to work. it's just Almost the API, impossible. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the API is like super hard to work with. Okay. Like, so, well, so, so, so I, I, I should just add that um, Clement, Clement Escoffier, who, who did, yeah. who started Newtony, initially he was against the idea. He didn't want to start this new project. He really wanted to use what the JDK had. That was mm -hmm. the initial idea and the plan for a while. But after like using it in practice for I don't know how long and then how, how many like demo applications, stuff like that, they just figure out that this is just so hard to use in mm -hmm. the real world. We, we need something that can at least like take some of the rough edges away from the reactive programming. Yeah. Um. Okay, so if I do something completion stage, and then if I block in the completion stage, I do thread sleep. So uh, mm -hmm. what happens then? Then you, you're you have one less event loop thread uh, in so, your in your application. Then Quarkus recognizes that, and after two hundred milliseconds or whatever, I get an error, right? So it says, okay, this you are blocking. Uh, do yeah, something. So Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there, Vertex has a way to detect whether an event loop thread has been blocked. So then, yeah, you get a bunch of errors in the console saying it's blocked, blocked, blocked. So, like, if you're seeing this in production, that's bad, right? The, the real value of this is to see it during development, and then yeah. you, you, you should be able to figure out, uh, or at least, like, investigate why. Like, if you're seeing this in production, you're probably going to have a problem. So what it means is... So if you have reactive uh, framework, mm -hmm. you must no, not have a CPU-intensive task there because they will take longer, right? So if so, you would like mm -hmm. encryption or whatever, it, 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 it's just something or a Bitcoin mining or whatever. It is a really <laughs> bad idea, right? To have yeah. even a for loop which does something because mm -hmm. then you are blocking the reactive threads. So reactive is only good if you, you have lots of I.O., but if you have a, a, a high CPU demand, mm -hmm. Then it's a problematic. Yes. Okay. So that is exactly right. That is something that like most people don't understand. Uh, reactive is bad for any task that takes non-trivial time to complete. Mm -hmm. Right. And like you said, like if it's IO, then it's great because you know you're blocked on some IO and you can go do something else. But <laughs> when it's CPU, right, like whatever it is, then there is no way to um, offload this task and do something else because you need the CPU active. So if you're taking like 50, even 50, 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds to do something uh, on because it's like CPU intensive, then you should absolutely not be doing that on an event loop thread because like let's say you have like a, a, a eight core machine, right? And we have like eight event loop threads. If at some point all those eight are doing like this 100 millisecond computation, everything else has to wait. Like all the other requests that are coming in have to wait. And that is just catastrophic for, for performance. Yeah. But could you do a hack? It's like, okay, in this case, I know that the CPU is intensive, you know, and say, and I would like to offload it to, to, to thread pool only in this case. This could work, right? Uh, well, so, so, okay, so theoretically, yes. We don't do any of that, like, magic figuring out of what yeah. you're doing in Quarkus. Uh, and we, we basically force you to, like, decide what you're yeah. going to do. Yeah. Uh, but theoretically, like, it, it is possible to uh, do but, something uh, how, more. How we can decide with annotations, right? Yes. So you have the annotations, you have the blocking, non-blocking, or if you don't have that, we decide on the return type. So we could use, uh, for instance, if I would call a method which looks which uh, looks for you reactive, but I know it is CPU intensive, mm -hmm. I could put annotation blocking on it, yeah, and yeah, then exactly. I solve the problem. Exactly, absolutely, this would be yeah, the absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Now um, the last thing maybe is interesting. Let's mm -hmm. say we have JaxRS, mm -hmm. and now I have Panache or Hibernate, and uh, I'm, I would also uh, use it in reactive way. So it is already mm -hmm. assuming that the GDBC driver is also reactive, right? So then, then everything has to be reactive. Otherwise, okay. Uh, so when you're using Hibernate Reactive, we don't use the GDBC drivers. Ah. We use we use Vertex uh, database drivers, which have been rewritten to not to be non-blocking. So they don't use the GDBC drivers. GDBC drivers are blocking uh, by default. Uh, there's no like way to make them not to make them non-blocking. 
That's so, interesting. So I mean, so the mm-hmm. Hibernate uses uh, proprietary Vertex drivers, which is nothing against that. It's just I mean, this Hibernate, mm-hmm. I don't care what's behind, but uh, it's talked to Postgres or whatever. And mm-hmm. you will have to have a drivers for the given database in order to, to, to make it work, right? Yeah, yeah. We provide those, but yes, you, 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 that's what you have to do. Exactly. Okay. You know what happens behind the scenes? Similar story maybe, right? So there is a non-blocking uh, channel until the end. If something blocks, the threat is it just waits without consuming any resources. And if mm-hmm. the database has something to tell, it just uh, pings the threat, it wakes up and, and pushes the information back, right? Right, mm-hmm. exactly, yeah. That's exactly, so that, that, that's the beauty of like, uh, let's say a reactive architecture, is mm-hmm. that when you have a lot of blocking points in, in, in the whole, uh, let's say, path of handling a request. So let's say like you're doing a, a database call, then you're also doing a REST call, then you're doing something else, that's blocking, then your actual utilization in the machine that's handling the request is very, very small because most of the time you're just waiting for a request and you're doing something else while you're waiting. What, but in the blocking world, like the larger, the more blocks you have, IO blocks, the, the more time you're, you're uh, tying up resources on the machine, right? Yeah, but again, uh, that, that, all, that, that only becomes a problem when you're like at, at high levels of concurrency. Yeah. Like when I say high, I mean very high. Um, maybe it was 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, the GMS became very popular, and uh, at least in Germany, it was uh, driven by a GMS consultants who wanted to sell products, right? <laughs> and um, and uh, what happened is uh, it was very popular, and 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 uh, there was a message message oriented middleware, MOM, mm-hmm. and and you know the 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 uh, uh, message oriented architectures, and and the problem was if you have a website, and you call the server, right? So what what people did was uh, you had a, um, a regular, let's say JaxOS, which returns hello, and uh, the parameter is like the message. So and, and depending right. on mm-hmm. message, you get different hello. So it's mm-hmm. input output. So what, mm-hmm. what they did is, this was before Jack's arrest, um, they blocked, sent a message, and waited until, you know, the response arrives, right. which mm-hmm. uh, caused a lot of trouble. Because if you think about this, right, you need one transaction to send the message, another transaction to receive the message on the other one, then the right. processing yeah. happened, you know, you need an, an, another transaction to send it, send, send it back. And then the question is, what happens if nothing happens, right? Because let's say the system died, you will you will wait forever, and there was actually no solution to the problem. So I would say reactive programming or messages, messaging, can be great if nothing blocks, you know? It is a natural use case if you have one channel in, like a mm-hmm. WebSocket, and you get from the other side just you no know, messages, and this is beautiful. But mm-hmm. if you have to block somewhere, there's basically no answer anymore, because if you block, the question is, how long can I block? And what happens on timeout? Did yes. something happen mm-hmm. or nothing happens? And this is an unsolved problem. So, um, yeah, this is why um, I think that reactive programming can be, can, can be great if, you, if, if your use case is reactive. But mm-hmm. most cases are not reactive, you know. And, and, and therefore, if we stick with classic... We only achieve twenty thousand transactions per second, and for thirty-five thousand transactions per second, we have to do something. Right? <laughs> yeah, but most people won't won't yeah. reach that level, right? But uh, interesting observation in your mm-hmm. tech empower diagram. Yes, there was a hump, so like a like a mountain, and then a ditch. You know, this was like a, it, it, the the curve. It did it, it looked strange, and I read it, and um and the reason for that was interesting. So it uh, what what you find out is, or someone from your team, is that probably, um, probably Francesco, yeah, yeah, that uh, <laughs> pulling threads is inefficient. And what what they what they found out is really interesting is, so before you die, all threads are taken and mm-hmm. busy. If all threads are busy, your system runs the best. Mm-hmm. But if one request more comes, you know, the yeah, threat die, is yeah. exhausted and you die. Yeah. So this this explained this was actually interesting observation. This explained <laughs> why you know shortly okay, before you yeah. die, you you run the best, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like I said earlier, there, there's a cliff 
when yeah. you're doing blocking, there's a cliff. Like you reach it, and a little more, you just collapse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's that's funny. Perfect. I think we discuss deeply reactive programming Jack Sears, right? Actually, yeah, no, it was uh, it was great. Yeah, so I I very much appreciate the chance to to go over these concepts and then provide a little history of like why we did things the way we did. So yeah, it's been awesome. So after exciting Jack's arrest, the next time we'll talk about boring length chain, right? And then <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 that, that's the craze uh, these days. I mean, I've been, you've been going to conferences too. I've been going to conferences and yeah. like everything is length chain and AI, which is, it, it's very nice in one sense, but it's also very nice to be able to talk about like, foundational technologies like we've yeah. been talking about here. But uh, as a cliffhanger to next time, so what Langchain 4J and Quarkus are is this more like, uh, for me, it seems like almost like JPA abstraction to LLMs, right? So you have a nice uh, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. set That's of interfaces exactly. and you can call whatever you like and, and just use, you know, LLMs efficiently without mm-hmm. caring about the details. So this will exactly. talk the next time, right? Exactly. That, that's exactly like how Max from our team who co-leads, Max Anderson who co-leads Quarkus, that's exactly how he described it. Like on oh, the, okay. hibernate, the hibernate of LLMs. That's exactly so, how uh, uh, Hibernate is wrong. It's JPA. One of yeah, that's, hibernate, you know? yeah, yeah that, that's... So, so I have to talk with him, you know? So, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So awesome. where, where people can find you on internet, you know, some pointers on... Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so my uh, Twitter handle is... G E O A N D eighty six. The Darth Vader, right? Yeah, yeah, want. exactly, exactly. And on GitHub, it's G E O A N D. So there's again the same Darth Vader um, avatar. On LinkedIn, it's my name, like the the, the whole full Greek uh, name. You can find me. I, I don't think there's anybody else uh, with that name. And, and say um, it in Greek. Yo, yeah, name, it's, your in Greek, yeah, yeah, it's Georgios Andrianakis. Yeah. Okay. Very good. <laughs> perfect thank you see you next time awesome awesome thanks for your time talk to you soon